Shalom, brothers and sisters. Giving all praises to the Most High in Christ. Okay? Today's topic, we're going to deal with the 12 tribes of Israel, who they are and where they're located. My name is Nathanya Alaga, and to my right, Banyamya. Okay? Because there's a common misconception out here in the world today that the Lord destroyed the 12 tribes of Israel that now you can be a spiritual Israelite because the 12 tribes have been destroyed. Now is that true according to the Bible? Let's go to Romans chapter 11 and read verses 1 and 2. In the New Testament for you hypocrites, okay? I say then, hath the Most High cast away his people. What's the subject? The Most High's people. God's people. Did he cast them away? Let's find out. Read. The Most High forbid. It says God forbid, meaning no. So here in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes it crystal clear that the Most High did not destroy the nation of Israel. They're not eradicated. They're not gone. Okay, read on. For I also am an Israelite. Because Paul comes back and says, because I also am an Israelite. Read. Of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Read on. The Most High have not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So, why is there all this confusion out in all the churches? Because you've all been teaching lies, because you've learned lies. The Most High has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Meaning, the people he dealt with in the past, from the time of Moses, when Moses came out of um, Egypt with the children of Israel, those are the people the Most High foreknew. Okay, those are the same people he's dealing with today. Okay, so the Bible gives you the characteristics of the 12 tribes of Israel, okay, and where they're located today. And we're going to prove that. Okay, I'm going to read for Benjamin, and he's going to further um, expound on the tribes. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 49, and we're going to start at verse 1. Okay, you've got to listen to what Jacob tells his sons. He says, these things shall happen to you in the last days. Okay. But before we go to Genesis 49, let's go to um, 2nd Ezra, chapter uh, 14. We're going to read verses 1 to 6. Uh, the book that we're reading is entitled uh, The Apocrypha. This book was taken out by the so-called white man. It was originally included in the original King James Version 1611. But because it revealed too much about the end of times and who the wicked was, being the so-called white man, the so-called white man had it removed. Okay, so a lot of you know that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, he dealt with the Heavenly Father. And he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. But a lot of you ignorantly believe that Moses was up there 40 days and 40 nights simply receiving 10 commandments. Now that's simple. How he's going to be up in a mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and only get 10 commandments? He was up there receiving much more than 10 commandments. There's over 600 commandments, and he also receives something else. And Ezra records it. So let's read 2 Ezra chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. And it came to pass upon the third day, I sat under an oak, and behold, there came a voice out of a bush over against me, and said, Ezra, Ezra. And I said, Here, here am I, Lord, and I stood upon my feet. Then said he unto me, in the bush I did meet, I did manifestly reveal myself unto Moses and talk with him when my people serve in Egypt. Right. So now the Most High is revealing something to Esdras. He's telling Esdras what he revealed to Moses. Read on. And I sent him and led my people out of Egypt and brought him up to the Mount of Sinai where I held him by me a long season. Where I held him by me a long season. That was the 40 days and 40 nights. Read. And told him many wondrous things. And told Moses many wondrous things. Read. And showed him the secrets of the times. And showed him the secrets of the times. Please read that again. And showed him the secrets of the times. And showed him the secrets of the times. Remember, it was Moses that recorded the first five books of Genesis. Oh, the first five books, excuse me. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Most High revealed to Moses the cre whole creation, okay, and Moses was recording it. He also showed him the end of times. That's what we're about to read about in Genesis 49. Read on. And the end 
and commanded him, saying, Wait, read it again. And showed him the secrets of the times and the end. And the end. So, yes, Moses knew about the end times, what was going to happen. Read. And commanded him, saying, These words shalt thou declare, and these shalt thou hide. Right. These words shalt thou declare, meaning made manifest openly. And certain things the Most High told Moses, make that a deep mystery, or don't write that part down. Okay, so now let, let's read about that in Genesis chapter 49. Because although these are the words of Jacob speaking to his 12 sons, it's the Most High telling Moses what Jacob said to his sons. All right, so Genesis 49, I'm going to read verse, I'm going to read it and then you expound on it. Right. Genesis 49 and verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So Jacob called his sons, all his sons together, and told his sons what was going to happen to his sons in the last days, what was going to happen to you as a tribe, as a nation of people, what was going to be for you, what was going to be the end times of the prophecy that was written in the Bible. Read on. Gather yourselves together, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. So this is showing you, Jacob was talking to his sons, the Israelites, not Africans, not Arabs, not Chinese, not Japanese, but the Israelites, the twelve tribes of Israel. Read on. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. So stop. He's stressing right here. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. Reuben was the firstborn son of Jacob. Read on. The beginning of my strength. And Reuben was the beginning of his strength because that's natural. Whenever you have a son or your firstborn son, he's always the beginning of your strength. That's where all your glory your uh, posterity, your riches, and so forth goes to your son. Read on. Excuse me. The excellency of dignity. And the excellency of dignity. Now, Reuben, through our extensive research, I found that Reuben represents the so-called Seminole Indians scattered throughout the Florida Everglades, which are the Seminole Indians, so-called Seminole Indians. Read on. So it says, Reuben is the beginning of my strength and the excellency of dignity. The excellency of dignity is that the Seminole Indians carry themselves in a royal and honorable dignity. They refuse willingly to submit to the so-called white man's surrendering of signing uh, peace treaties. They did what they were forced and tricked into signing one peace treaty. But they did not sign into many peace treaties like the rest of their brothers, like the, uh, the Sioux and the Cheyenne and these different tribes. So Reuben kept that dignity. Read on. And the excellency of power. And the excellency of power. Great warriors. Great leaders. Read on. May I say yeah. one thing? Also, in terms of that, the tribe of Reuben, okay, when you examine the way they dress, they wore the mitri, right. like Bun Yemen has on his head. They were known for wearing the mitri. That was a holy dress code according to the Most High that he gave to the nation of Israel. For he ordained for them to wear the mitri, okay? And when the so-called white man had, was forcing the five civilized nations of the American Indians to enslave the American blacks, okay, it was the Seminoles that refused. The Seminoles had told the white man, yeah, okay, we'll enslave them, but what did they do? They made the American blacks kings and princes and had them marry the choice of their women, okay, unlike the Choctaw and the Chickasaw who, who agreed and put the American black in hard slavery, just like the so-called white man, because the white man had told them, if you do this, we will allocate you certain freedoms, okay? But Reuben, the Seminole Indians, they tricked the white man. They said, yeah, we'll do it. And what did they do? When the white man went back, they said, why do you have the blacks up sitting as kings and chiefs, okay? That's what was going on. So the tribe of Reuben was the excellency of dignity, okay? and the excellency of power. So I'm going to read on. Now, uh, before you read on, I'd like to show you, like the brother said, about the Seminole Indians wearing uh, turbans. It's in this book called The Black Indians by William Lawrence Katz. It's on our uh, page, page 57. You have a group of Seminole Indians at delegation to Washington, D.C. Okay. So I'm going to read on. I'm in verse 4 now. Mm -hmm. Unstable as water. So when it says Reuben was unstable as water, what was happening, Reuben were like nomads. They traveled back and forth. 
They didn't stay in one stationary places. They constantly kept moving back and forth. Why? Because they were under the oppression of the so-called white man when he sent his military troops to go and fight against the Seminole Indians. Continue on. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then the fathers thou it. He went up to my couch. So Jacob was still in Reuben also because what he did to his father, he defiled his father's bed by taking his concubine. He slept with his father's concubine. So Jacob told Reuben, thou shalt not excel in that category, and also he shall not excel when he came over to the Americas and when the white man, so-called white man, was going to conquer the Seminole Indians. They did not excel in fully defeating the so-called white man because the so-called white man eventually took over all of the Americas and the Seminole Indians became subjected to the so-called white man way of life. Right. One of the main guys was Andrew Jackson. Right. He was one of the generals in the army that helped destroy, not destroy, but subdue of uh, the tribe of Reuben, the Seminole Indians, around 1829 to 1837 in that time area. Andrew Jackson was one of the key crackers, key, key Edomites to defeat, to bring down the Seminole Indians. I'd like to read this. It says, this is on page 60. It says, Be before this conflict was over, the United States had fought, has fought its most costly Indian war, spending over 40 million and losing 1,500 so soldiers and many civilians. They battled an enemy, one U.S. officer called bold, active, and armed, the black Seminoles, more desperate than the Indians. So he's showing about the character of the Seminole Indians. And the one of the uh, generals that fought against him was uh, Thomas Jessup, General Jessup. And he was the main guy who fought against the Indians. I'm going to like to read a, uh, a small uh, commentary what he spoke about the, uh, the Seminole Indians. He said here in June 1787, excuse me, on page 62, in June 1837, he admitted as much. We have at no former period in our history had to contend with, with so formidable an enemy. No seminar proves false to his country, nor has a single instance ever occurred of a first-rate first rate warrior having surrendered. So he's showing the excellence and the dignity of the Seminole Indians. They were skillful warriors. And when you read this whole book, it tells you about the wars they fought against the U.S. Cavalry. We have to show some pictures, too, of the Seminole Indians, some brief pictures. This book is called Native Americans. The name of the book is called Native Americans. And on page 22, 23, 24, and 25, we're going to show brief uh, pictures of the Seminole Indians. Seminole Indians, page 23, is a group of Seminole women, Seminole Indians women, so-called. As you were showing on the screen, the Seminole Indians, so we, we had to go to the book of Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter, and the 6th verse. Right. This is the blessing wherewith Moses blessed the 12 tribes of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33. So the understanding, so you, so you just get the understanding. On how do we know who the 12 tribes are? You need three chapters primarily. You need Genesis chapter 49, you need Deuteronomy 33, and also Deuteronomy 28. We're mainly going to concentrate on Genesis 49 and Deuteronomy 33. And one more book, the Apocrypha. Right, and the Apocrypha. Okay. So, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 6. Let Reuben live and not die. And let not his men be few. So like we're showing, this was Moses. Moses was prophesying to Reuben because Moses saw the beginning and the end of all the tribes. So when Moses said, let Reuben live and not die and let his men be few, he was showing you the event, what was going to happen to the Seminole Indians when they came to the Americas and they were going to be slaughtered and butchered by the so-called white man under his cavalry, his military. So he prophesied this event and said, let not Reuben die and his men be few. Why? Because the Most High had to preserve a remnant of his people. Like we read in Romans 11, the Most High has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So we'd like to show up, uh, read one more scripture, 1 Chronicles, the 5th chapter, and the 18th verse. It says, the sons of Reuben and the Gadites. Now the sons of Reuben, like we mentioned before, and the Gadites, which are brothers to the Seminole Indians. Read on. And half the tribe of Manasseh, which are another brother to uh, Seminole uh, Reuben. Read on. Of valiant men, see they were valiant men, warriors, read on, 
Men able to bear buckler and sword. Men that could handle skill in weapons, any form of weapons, bows, arrows, swords, javelin, read on. And to shoot with bow. And to shoot with the bow. They were skillful in using the bow and arrows, read on. And skillful in war. And they were skillful in war. And you had many different uh, seminar Indian chiefs that fought against the U.S. cavalry. So we like to show this more than that. Uh, were four and forty thousand seven hundred and three score that went out to the war. So we like to show in the book, in another book called Lost Tribes and Promised Land. Right. In this book entitled Lost Tribes and Promised Lands, uh, by Ronald Sanders. Okay. This is a very important book. This is not a book that he just sat down and wrote up himself. The proof of that is in the uh, bibliography. When you open it up, it tells you where he got many of the stories from. It says, Passages from Spanish Explorers in the Southern United States from 1528 to 1543. So what are we about to read? Records. These are not mythical stories. These are records. And we're going to go to page 363 that further discusses the tribe of Reuben. I'm actually going to start at page 364 and 365. You can read from 363 to 365 on your own. I'm going to sum it up briefly. Uh, there's a, a white man by the name of Montezinos. Okay, he was a Morano, meaning he was a, a uh, converted Jew. Okay, a white man that converted to Judaism. And he was thinking about the, North Amer the native Indians. Okay, and this is what he says. It says, those Indians, he told himself, they are Hebrews. Okay. Eventually, so what happened here, I'm just going to skip all the way down. He goes out to find out about the Indians. He's in South America. This is before they had fully migrated up to the uh, southern coast of the Americas. He gets in a canoe. He goes over to where the Indians are. And this is the situation as follows. Eventually a canoe appeared, bearing three men and a woman, all of them Indians, to the place where Francisco, which is the Indian guide, and Montezinos, the white man, were standing at the water's edge. The woman got off and spoke to Francisco in an Indian tongue that Montezinos could not understand, Hebrew, although he could perceive that he was being identified in the conversation. She then turned to her male companions to explain the situation. Upon hearing her words, they arose, went over to Montezinos and said to his utter astonishment, said, I'm going to read it just as they have it. Shema Yisroel Adonai Eloheno Adonai Ehud, which is Yiddish. What they really said is Shema Yasha'ala, Yahawah Alahayanawah, Yahawah Ahud. Ahud meaning, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They had recited in Hebrew the fundamental credo of Judaism. They told him that they were themselves of the tribe of Reuben and that the tribe of Joseph lived on an island nearby. The tribe of Joseph, meaning Manasseh and Ephraim, okay, the, which are Manasseh being the Cubans, Cubans. and Cuban Indians, and uh, Ephraim, who are the so-called Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans, Tainos. Right, the Tainos and the Boricuas. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read on. Francisco told Montezinos all he knew about them from his own traditions. His ancestors, to their eternal shame, had indeed made war on them and persecuted them. Only the sorcerers of his tribe had perceived that they were a special people and had given warning that they should be left alone. The God of these children of Israel is the true God, um, they had said, and everything inscribed on their tablets is true. Now I'm going to pause here, and everything inscribed on their tablets is true. Because the white man has taught throughout America that the so-called Indians had an oral tradition. The records here says, and everything inscribed on their tablets is true, meaning they had records here. At the end of days, they will be lords of all the nations of the earth. I'm going to read that again. I like that. At the end of days, they, meaning the tribe of Reuben and the other 12 tribes, will be lords of all the nations of the earth. One nation will come bringing many things to this land, meaning Judah, Benjamin, Levi hadn't yet been brought over as slaves yet. And after we have all been provided for through the knowledge of the Most High, these children of Israel will go forth from where they now are and reign over all the earth 
as they once did. Ha! <laughs> With this final flourish, Montezinos had turned his tale of the lost tribes into a bit of propaganda. Then it goes on, blah, 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 blah. Right, he saw it turn his story into a myth and a fairy tale right. that the Indians over in the, uh, what they call a new world was savages. So this is the lies of a so-called white man to, uh, to spread his propaganda. So the next tribe will be Simeon and Levi. Simeon represents the Dominicans of Indian descent and Levi, which are the so-called Haitians that lives on the island of Haiti. So we begin at Genesis of 49th chapter and the fifth verse. Simeon and Levi are brethren. So what Jake, uh, Jacob is saying, he says, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Meaning when they said they are brethren, they share the same island known as Hispaniola, which is one side you have the Dominican Republic, and the other side you have Haiti. So it says Simeon and Levi are brethren. All the tribes are brethren, but he's stressing the point that Simeon and Levi, because these two brothers share one island that was known as Hispaniola, but later was divided into Santo Domingo and Haiti. Read on. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. And it says instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. The instrument of cruelty that's in their habitation is the witchcraft which they call voodoo that's used among the Haitians and the Santo Domingans. So that's the instrument of cruelty that's in the island. That's the main instrument that they use against their own people. And it was also used against the French when, when uh, uh, the Haitians fought against the French. But looking at today, our people use this witchcraft amongst their own people, which is known as voodoo. All right? Right. Can I show them a few clips of it? Uh, in this book here entitled Haiti, Feeding the Spirit, we're going to show you a few clips on the voodoo. Okay? Over, as it's brought out in Haiti, they call it voodoo. It's in, the Dominican in, the, in the Dominican Republic, you call it brujaria, okay, which is evil magic. So, as you can see for yourself, you see the various clips on the Haitians doing their witchcraft. The same thing in the Dominican Republic. So now I'm going to read on to verse 6. O my soul, come not thou into their secret. So what Jacob was saying, O my soul, come not thou into their secret. He want his righteous spirit that he has to go into what they was going to deal with, which was a witchcraft, because that witchcraft was going to turn to the left-hand side, to negative. It wasn't going to be used in the positive. Read on. Unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. So the assembly is their gathering when they have these witchcraft together, when they work in these assemblies of witchcraft amongst the witch doctors and the, and the mass of the people. Read on. Read the part again. It says, unto their assembly, my honor. Unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united. So he said, for this, they were not going to be united. That's why Haiti and Santo Domingo is divided. So he didn't want them to be united in that purpose. Because if they came together, it would be very destructive. So he said, be, now, be thou not united. Read on. All right, let me say one thing. And when they're on that island of Hispaniola, the Haitians are speaking French, the Dominicans are speaking Spanish. They're divided in language, okay? And culture. Right. Okay. And they hate each other. They dislike one another. On the same island. That shows you that the Bible is true. It know the most high knows exactly what he's saying. I'm gonna read on. For in their anger they slew a man. So this goes back in the past when we were back in the land of Israel. What happened? They uh, some men had raped their sister, Dinah. So they told him, okay, you can have marry my sister. So they said, I'll for you to marry my sister. You must become circumcised. So when these men became circumcised and they were all sore and sitting back, they went and slew all the men. They slew all these African men that raped their sister. Read on. I'm going to read on. And in their self-will, they dig down a wall. So I mean, they destroy a whole city of Africans when they were back in the land of Israel. And their father Jacob was afraid of what they have done. Read on. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. He said, Cursed be their anger, because it was fierce. And their anger today is still fierce towards their own people. Continue on. And their wrath, for it was cruel. And they're still cruel today, too. Read on. I will divide them in Jacob. So Jacob said, according to the prophecy of the most I was going to do, he was going to divide them in Jacob. That's why he's divided by Santo Domingo and the Isle of Haiti. Read on. And scattered them in Israel. And we were scattered. How were we scattered? When we were brought to this part of the world in slavery, on the slave ships. 
Right. Also, that goes when uh, the Most High, when the Levites were set up, they were scattered throughout all Israel. Also, the, 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 the they didn't have an inheritance of land. Right, the priests. Yeah. Right. Because they were the priests of the nation of Israel. Right. That story that he brought, that Banyama had mentioned concerning uh, Dinah and Simeon and Levi, that's a terrible story. Because, as he brought out, when that African prince had slept with their sister, Simeon and Levi wanted revenge. Okay, and they said, all right, as he said, you want to marry our sister? All your vi village has to get circumcised. So Simeon and Levi waited till the sun is set in. Then they struck and they attacked. What with the swords? Right. And I showed you Simeon and Levi, they had power. They wasn't no weak guys. <laughs> These dudes was terrible and powerful. And in this book entitled Black Indians by William Lauren Katz, I'm going to go to page 33 in this book. And it talks about a similar situation with Simeon and Levi meaning the Haitians and the Dominicans. I'm going to go to it real quick. And then you're saying too, back in, the, in Israel, they used swords. Back in the island of Haiti, they used what you call a machete, or a machete. It's the same thing. So it's the same instrument, uh, weapons of war, that they used to fight against the enemies or against their own people. Right. Check this out. I'm on page 33. In 1522, Europeans in the Americas first learned that slavery did not easily lead to enormous wealth. On Christmas Day, African and Indian, meaning it's referring to the Haitians and the Indians of Santo Domingo, but they put African here, slaves on a plantation owned by Diego Columbus rose and murdered their masters and overseers. Nearby Native Americans joined the rebels because they had brought Native American Indians, the tribe of Gad, over to serve slavery in Santo Domingo. The beautiful island of Santo Domingo shook with the first recorded slave rebellion in the New World. The conspiracy had spread across the sprawling sugar plantations in the weeks before Christmas. Patiently waiting, the plotters waited until Christmas Day when the planters and their families would be bloated with food, soaked with liquor, and too weak or sleepy to, to offer much resistance. Then they struck, plunging into the night to kill whites and find freedom. So that's the same Saints similar story that happened in the Bible. With, with Simeon and Levi. Right. <laughs> And then, going back to the history book called Slavery, in this book it tells you the word Haiti that was called by the native Indians that occupied that land before the Negro slaves were brought there. It tells you in this book that uh, Columbus cruising to the coast of Cuba, he cast anchor off an island that the natives called Haiti, meaning mountainous country. So that the word Haiti came from the, from the Indians, meaning, mountain, uh, meaning a mountainous country. But when the French got there, they called it hell, high ground, because of all the hell that they caught from the uh, Haitians when they rebelled against the slave masters. So it was the French that were oppressing the Haitians. So there was a great leader that rose up. His name was Toussaint. And this is what it says on Toussaint. Only seven months later, Napoleon gave up his attempt to force Haiti back into slavery because Napoleon hated black people. He was a staunt hater of black people. And it says, Toussaint had won after all. The French withdrew, withdrew leaving 60,000 of their soldiers and sailors dead on the island. On the last day of 1803, Haiti formally proclaimed its independence, so-called independence, from the hardcore bondage of the French. So what is it showing you? That the French caught much hell under the Haitians when they were rebuilt. And the so-called Haitians were the first to proclaim uh, independence in the so-called Western world. Right. The next thing, when you go to the libraries, there's a book entitled Christopher Columbus and the Participation of the Jews in the Spanish and Portuguese Discoveries by Dr. M. Kaserling. If the cameraman could get close up on this. Uh, this is a reference book. You're not going to be able to take the book out. But I'm going to read a few references from page 95 on. Okay. Proving that the Indians of the Dominican Republic in Cuba, they are Israelites. It says this, in Cuba, Española, which is the Dominican Republic, and the other islands which he discovered, Columbus found natives who had their caciques, meaning kings, and their own language and traditions. To what race did these aborigines of America belong? Several, several writers have asserted and have displayed much learning in attempting to prove that the aborigines were descendants of the Jews. 
This result was reached already in the 16th century by the Spanish clergyman Roldan. His arguments were derived from an unpublished manuscript which he discovered in the library of San Pablo in Seville. Okay. Let me jump down real quick. So then I'm going to go to page 98. Of more interest than the mode of migration is the question whether any analogies in language, in traditions, in religious conceptions, or in religious ceremonies justify the acceptance of this ethnological theory, which it does. As you stick around, we're going to show you the language of the um, Indians throughout the islands. Rolden's chief argument in support of his view is the language of the Indians in Española, which is the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Jamaica, and the adjoining islands. He contends that it has many resemblances to Hebrew. It was Hebrew, and we're going to prove it. In fact, he even calls it corrupted Hebrew, because many, they had picked up other languages from the uh, called white men, different words, and inserted it in. He asserts that such names as Cuba and Haiti are Hebrew, and that they were first applied by the earliest caciques, meaning kings, the chiefs or the leaders, who discovered and peopled the island. Okay, the names of rivers and the persons in use among the natives are derived from the Hebrews. I'm going to go to page 99. They also sacrificed first fruits on high mountains and under shady trees. They sacrificed first fruits because that was a high holy day, called first fruits, set up and ordained by the Most High in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. They had temples and carried a holy ark before them in time of war. <laughs> Just like the Israelites did, because they are the Israelites. They were also like the ten tribes inclined to idol worship. Okay, so this is a book you can go to the library and examine for yourself in the reference libraries. Okay, so now let's go back to the scriptures. Deuteronomy uh, 33. Deuteronomy 33, 33 and uh, verse 8. Right. It says this, And of Levi he said, let thy thummim and thy urim be with the Holy One. Now, when it says, and of Levi, he said, let the thummim and urim be with thy Holy One, because Levi were the priests of the nation of Israel. Aaron, Moses' brother, and his sons became the high priests of the nation. The high priests who were Eleazar, Eleazar's son, which was Moses' uh, brother, his sons became the successive high priests. So the Levites... Certain groups of the Levites, you had high priests, you had priests, and you had certain section of the Levites. Now, the sons of Eleazar were the one that wore the thummy and the urim. Now, the thummy and the urim were like balls that gave up illumination, were something like crystal balls. And the Most High would speak uh, to the priests and would show them certain events that would take place which concerned the nation and concerned the priests. Now, and it says, and of Levi, he said, let the thummy and you and thy urim be with thy holy one, which was his priests. Now the holy ones that's not that's dwelling with our people now is not the righteous spirit of the Mosa. What they're dealing with is the witchcraft and with Satan. Because like I said, the Haitians were the priests of the nations. And it says, it says, Let the thumbing and thy urine be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa. So who was at Massa with Moses? It was the Levites and the rest of the Israelites that provoked Moses and the priests that were Moses at, at Massa. Because Moses struck the rock to give them water. And it's going to explain for him. With whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. So this part when he said about the thermal and the urim. Is that you know that the priests used the thermal and the urim. Which were like crystal balls. That gave off a certain illumination. To let the priests know what the Moses was going to relate. To his high priest and so forth. And it says the ninth verse. Read on. Who said unto his father and to his mother. I have not seen him. Neither did he acknowledge his brethren. So this is speaking about Levi. When, when it came to pass, when uh, it was asked, uh, when Joseph was so in Egypt, it was asked of Levi, where was his brother? And Levi said, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him. Neither did he acknowledge his brethren. Now when you look at it today, the Haitians today don't acknowledge the so-called black Americans or the West Indians. They merely keep to themselves. Amongst themselves, they don't associate. If they will speak to you, but the close, far as dealing association is many among their own people. They do not acknowledge their brethren. Continue on. Right. One more thing, one more aspect to that. When it says, uh, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did acknowledge all his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word. Goes back to Exodus 32 also, when 
Moses came down from Mount Sinai, okay, and the children of Israel were in all manner of wickedness and fornication. And the Mosai said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come here. And the Levites came to Moses. And he said, every, let it, every Levite take his sword and slay the wicked of Israel. And they, it says the Levites didn't care if it was their mother, their father, <laughs> or their children. They just slaughtered them, put them to death. Okay, so I'm going to read on now in verse 10. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments, and Israel thy law. Right, so that was the job of the Levites, to teach the law. They were the lawgivers of the law also, to teach Israel the laws of the Most High, the, and so forth. That was the job of the priests, to do the sacrificing, to burn the incense in the temple, and it goes on and on. That was their job, to do the service of the Most High strictly. Read on. They shall put incense before thee, and whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. So their job was to burn the incense, right, the incense in the, in the temple, sacrifice the animals for the sins of the people and for themselves, and for the atonement of the sins of the entire nation. Uh, continue, and it says, uh, read on. So we like to go to Malachi. Right. Malachi, what chapter? We're going to go to Malachi chapter 2, and what we're going to read is verses 1, 3, 8 and 9, so we can just get through it briefly. Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. Okay, let me jump to verse 3. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. Now, this happened to the Levites. When this happened? When we were brought here in slavery, the, the uh, Haitians. Why? There are no more priests to the Mosai because what are they dealing with now? Witchcraft, evil, all sorts of evil and madness, as, a, as an entire nation, I should put it, we're dealing with wickedness and evil. So now, instead of doing righteousness, as doing the uh, burning the incense and the righteous or of the Most High, we're doing the evil sacrifices. Read on. Right, let me show them a, a, a photo of that from this book here. Okay, it shows them practicing their voodoo and spreading dung upon their faces. So this was, it was pathetic, all right? So, let me read on. Even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. Okay, so now let's jump down to verses 8 and 9. And now the solemn feast that they're keeping in Haiti and those islands is Eastern what? Eastern Christmas. Some of them do. If they're in the Roman Catholic Church, they either celebrate all the pagan customs of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the solemn feast that they're keeping. Right. Verse 8. But ye are departed out of the way. See? So the whole nation, but this was referring particularly to the Levites, the priests. They have went out of the Most High's way, which is his righteous order. Continue on. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. And that's what they did. Corrupted the covenant by doing what? Bringing in false uh, sacrifices, by going to pagan customs, by following the ways of the different nations, the Africans. Continue on. Verse 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people. And look at it. Haiti is the <laughs> poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. It's the poorest. And they're living in the most deplorable state. Continue on. According as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Right. Let me say this about right. that. When the most I said he made Levi contemptible and base before all the people, Meaning before all Israel. When you mistakenly ask, a, if you ask a black guy, are you Haitian? You know how insulted they get. Haitian? I ain't no Haitian. If you ask any of our people, they get, ins that's like the greatest insult to call them a Haitian. Because they've been reduced to being contemptible and base before all the people. And with many Dominicans, the biggest joke that they, uh, one of their jokes is to call another person. They say, do I don't Haitiano, meaning you are a Haitian. And they all think, ah, oh, ha, ha, that's like a joke to them because they consider the, the Levites, which are the Haitians, the most base of all right. people. And at one time, they were the most noblest of all. The priests, the Haitian priests, were noble men. The most I tells you, how, how has a fine gold become dim? The priests were royal men. The priests that were purity, all pure stuff. None was unclean or base could come around the priests. Not even a stranger could touch the food that belongs to the priests. Everything around the priest had to be pure, sanctified, and holy. The priest could not even have a woman that had a husband before. She had to have been a virgin. So it's showing that the high level that we were, on, were once on 
to the level that we are being brought down to. Right. So now let's go back to Deuteronomy 33 and verse 11 to finish up on uh, Levi. It says, Bless the Lord. Bless, Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him. So what was this? This was also prophecy showing you whoever's was going to rise up against the Haitians, like the French, the most I was going to give him that power to fight against their enemies. Read it on. And of them that hate him, that they rise not again. I like to show you in this book called Slavery. It's on page uh, 190 in the caption. It says, Refuse freedom by the French National Assembly. So the French National Assembly wanted to give the, uh, the Haitians freedom under their way of doing it. But the Haitians rebelled against that. They said, Haiti's slaves revolted in August 1791, burning down plantations and massacring whites. They massacred white people. And it says, Toussaint organized the slaves into a revolutionary army that could defeat the European troops. So this is also going back to this prophecy in this chapter, right in this verse right here, about the Haitians. Right, and that's going to go on a greater scale in these last days. The Most High is going to destroy everyone that comes up against them, that they rise not again. Because the white man's not going to rise again, according to this prophecy. Ever! Ever! And the next tribe is Judah, who is known today as the so-called black Americans, or some people say Afro-Americans. But these are natural names, or Negroes which you all make mockery of my Negroes. So, so you prefer, some people prefer the term Afro-Americans. But the true nationality is Judah. Right. right? Can, can we just get, since you said that, in Deuteronomy 20, I just got to get this since Benjamin brought that up. Deuteronomy 28 and 37, it says this. This is mainly for Judah. Listen. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword, among all nations, whether the Lord shall send thee. Because as he said, you call colored, some of you call yourself Afro-American, African-American, blacks American, or Nubians now. So that's what it means being called a byword, a proverb and a byword. Like there was a, a, a famous proverb, any, meeny, miny, mo, catch a nigga, by the toe, if he holler, let him go, any, meeny, miny, mo. Okay, so then you got all these bywords, you call every 10 years, the American, what's termed American black, changes their nationality. So that's Bible prophecy on the tribe of Judah. So now, let's go to Genesis 49 and verse 8. It says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Now it says, Judah, particularly speaking of the so-called black Americans. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Meaning, the rest of the tribe is going to acknowledge Judah for bringing forth the truth and teaching and showing that we are the Israelites, according to the Bible. Continuing. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Now when it says, thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies, it's referring to the so-called black Americans are situated in the most prominent situation of all the tribes, in the top leading position where they have the advantage to take hold of this system and bring this man down. So actually, their hand is up in the neck of the so-called white man's system, whether it's his political system, his military system, his economical system. They're up in the top elite of the system, where they have the position more advantage, uh, more advantage of the system than the rest of the tribes of Israel. So that's what it's talking about. When you look around, you see for yourself in the politics, in the in in, uh, in the Congress, in the sports world, in the entertainment world, in the economical field. You have a lot of black, so-called black Americans in that position because that's the prophecy that will be fit in, that will fit Judah. Continue on. Right. Let me say this. Yeah. Add this one thing. Also, when it says the neck of me, letting you know that Judah would be located primarily in North America, the top kingdom. The top kingdom. Okay. So let me read on. It says, "Thy father's children shall bow down before thee." Right. So the father's children, which is the rest of the tribes, is going to acknowledge and see that Judah is the head tribe that the Most High set up. That's the tribe the Most High set up to be the head and to show Israel and to guide and teach Israel. Continue on. And to prove that statement, briefly, let's go to Zechariah 12 and 7. It says, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. 
Okay, so the Most High is let, letting, the, the prophecy is letting us know that Judah would be exalted first. And Judah would be the top tribe who would give the knowledge to the rest of the tribes. So that way the other tribes would not exalt themselves against Judah. Because right now in this system, the tribes seem to be against Judah. They're always putting the tribe of Judah down. All oh, those blacks don't like to work. Oh, they're lazy. They're, they're Yankee welfare. boys. They're, they're on welfare. welfare. They ain't this, they ain't that. They've been here so long and they haven't achieved nothing. Right. So the Most High is letting, through prophecy, letting us know that Judah would be lifted up first. And Judah would be the one to gather the tribes, to spread the knowledge out. Okay? So let's go back to Genesis 49. The ninth verse. Ninth verse. Judah is a lion's whelp. So the most has given the characteristics of Judah. Judah is a lion's whelp, a young, frisky, courageous lion. Judah was like this back in the 60s when they started standing up for, uh, for the civil rights, for uh, black power, the black movement, and the different black groups, the Black Panthers, the freedom fighters, and, and going on. Continue. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. So from the prey, my son, the prey is the Bible, the knowledge of the Bible. Judah has gone away from the truth of the Bible, teaching that they're the Israelites, and they have gone into what? More into the political system. They have gone more into Africanism, Egyptology, and all the different uh, philosophies of this system and of the different nations. Read on. He stooped down. Now, when he said he stooped down, like a lion, when he stoops and he's getting prepared, read on. He couched as a lion. So he couched as a lion. So he was getting ready to prance and attack the enemy. When was this done? In the 60s, under the different Black Panthers, SNCC was, was about the revolutionary against the white man oppressing them, the white man oppressing them, and the different uh, riots and so forth. All this was the time when, in the 60s, when the blacks here in America was rebelling against the system because of the oppression against their people. Read on. And as an old lion. So that he, as an old lion, now, now, in the 90s, now he's more comfortable, he's talking about the political, it's more of an economical trend than more of a revolutionary trend. Read on. So now he's more of a, in a complacent state. Read on. Right. So let me say this. So back then, it looked like the American blacks, the tribe of Judah, was going to take down their enemy like a lion does. Right. He waiting. Right? Crouched like he was going to attack. But then yeah. what they do? They went, hmm. Just rolled over. After King died. And went to sleep and got into politics and all this other man. Y'all just went to sleep. So when the blacks in America went to sleep, it, they didn't just go to sleep on their own. Let's stress this point real good. This was a diabolical, demonic plot right. by the Illuminati, the FBI, the CIA, and the politicians to deliberately and conspiratorially destroy the blacks in America by using what? Drugs. By using infiltration. The, uh, the, call, uh, the FBI, money, bribery, using different black groups to fight against themselves to infiltrate and destroy black organization. So let you know, they didn't just fall asleep. This was a systematically set up to destroy the black organization. So after all the destruction of the blacks, Martin Luther King dying, and all the groups fell apart by uh, infiltration and bribery and all different tactics, then Jake fell asleep. Now when it came to the 90s now, they have become more complacent. It's all about economical gain, political gain. It's no more about revolution against the system. So continue. Who shall rouse him up? So who's going to rouse him up? The Most High by using Christ. And thirdly, by the prophecies and the events taking place in the Bible. All the world events that's taking place around America and throughout the world. Continue. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. And it said the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter is a royal staff used by kings. So the rulership shall not depart from Judah. Read on. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Nor a lawgiver between his feet, meaning the rulership, a leader of the nation. Read on. Until Shiloh come. Until Shiloh, which represents Jesus Christ the Messiah. So up until the time that Christ came, when the Romans were ruling over Jerusalem, on their leadership of the Pharisees, uh, Pharisees and the different sects of the Israelites, they had that rulership until it was taken from them when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. Read it on. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So unto Christ, which is the leader of the nation of Israel, who also came up in the tribe of Judah, and also unto Judah shall the gathering of the people be. That's going to teach the truth of the Bible, which is going to be passed on to the rest of the tribes of Israel. 
Read on. Binding his foal unto the vine. Now they're speaking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It said, bind his foal unto the vine. Read on. And his ass's colt unto the choice So vine. they're speaking about Christ when he came right into Jerusalem and an ass. This was fulfilled when he did that. Read on. He washed his garments in wine. So showing you that Christ drank so much wine, he washed his garments in wine. Christ drank so much wine. When you read the different scriptures in Matthew 11, 19, also too, it tells you uh, many scriptures. In Daniel, the 10th chapter, his eyes were a flame of fire. In Revelation, Daniel, his eyes were, la were last fire. Read on. And his clothes in the blood of grapes. Meaning he drank so much wine, it was as if his clothes were stained in, the, in wine. And also showing the characteristics of the so-called black man. He drinks a lot of wine. Read on. His eyes shall be red with wine. Speaking still about the Messiah, his eyes shall be red with wine, which was fulfilling when? Matthew's 11th chapter in the 19th verse. Also about the black man too. He drinks a lot of wine. Read on. And his teeth white with milk. And his teeth white with milk. Showing you the characteristics of the black man. His teeth shall be white. Back in slavery, you had a picture called a black sample where you show a black man's screen and showing his white teeth, his white pearly teeth. All right, continue on, Deuteronomy 33 chapter. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 7. And this is the blessing of Judah. And this is the blessing of Judah. Why is the blessing? That the Most High was going to set up Judah to bring forth the truth and the knowledge of the Bible showing that we are the Israelites. Read on. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. So he's saying, hear, Lord, hear the voice of Judah. Hear his prayers when he cries out to you in the affliction, in the time of affliction. Read on. And bring him unto his people. Bring him unto his people, the entire nation of Israel, the West Indians, the Haitians, the Puerto Ricans, the people that are listed on the sign that you see on the camera. Let his hands be sufficient for him. So let his hands be sufficient as far as dealing with this truth, as getting the information that's needed, Bringing forth the truth to our people. Read on. And be thou in help to him from his enemies. And be thou in help to him from his enemies. Who is the enemies? The so-called white man and all nations that are in America. So the most is protecting us when we go forth to do his work and teach on the streets. Right. So now let's go to the book of Joel. Okay. We're going to go to the book of Joel chapter 3. And we're going to read verse 1, 3, and six, briefly, okay? Joel chapter three and one. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. This is a future prophecy. That's the time we're living in. Continue. Because uh, Judah and Jerusalem represents the whole nation. We're still in captivity. Read on. Verse three. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot. When was this done in slavery? In the 1600s. Read on. And sold a girl for wine. That was the purpose of sl slave trade. The Africans and the Arabs sold us in slavery, and they sold us. And they sold a girl for wine. Read on. That they might drink. And they did drink the wine. Read on. Uh, verse 4. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon? So the Mosai is speaking to who? The Africans. Why? Because they these people were the original inhabitants of the land of Tyre and Zidon. Continue on, read on. And all the coast of Palestine. And who's running the coast of Palestine now? The Arabs. That's fighting over the land of Israel. So it's showing you that the, Af the Africans and the Arabs were involved in the slave trade in selling us to the so-called white man. Read on. Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? So the Most High said, no matter what they do, if they pray to him a hundred thousand times a day, and they say, well, we're sorry what we did, the most says he's not going to forgive them. He's going to return a recompense upon their own heads. No much how much Allah, what by they sing or shout, the most is not going to forgive what they have done to his people. Right. Let me say this. When recompense meaning pay back. Right. The all the nations were envious over Judah and the other tribes being the chosen of the most high. So Tyre and Zidon, the Africans and Palestine, meaning the Arabs, figured, look, we could pay the most high back for not choosing us. Let's destroy them. Let's put them in slavery. So the Most High said, if you do that, thinking you're paying me back for not choosing you as my chosen people, swiftly and speedily will I return your own payback upon your own head. Okay? So now we're in verse, I'm going to jump down to verse 6. Okay? The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians. Now, this is showing you. It's showing you right here who sold us is the children of Judah, the so-called black Americans, and the children of Jerusalem, the rest of the tribes of Israel. When it also it said Jerusalem, it also includes 
Benjamin and Levi, the so-called West Indians and Haitians. They said the children also of Judah and, Jer and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians. Why is it saying the Grecians? Because the Greeks was the first ruling empire of the so-called white man. And all white people stem from the Greeks. So it's talking about the so-called white people, Europeans, up until this day, America. Read on. That ye might remove them far from their border. And we were removed far from our border, which is Jerusalem. We were sold from the west coast of Africa, but we migrated down into Africa in the time of 70 AD. And we're going to show you in, in different historical books called Babylon to Timbuktu. So from the west coast of Africa, we were sold by the Africans and the Arabs to the so-called white man. Right. So from there, let's jump back to Deuteronomy 28 and let's get verse 68 to show you how they removed us far from our border on slave ships. Does the Bible speak about that? Yes. And we're going to prove it. Deuteronomy 28, 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again. Now, with, which, read on. With ships. This was the second time. The first time that we were in Egypt was with uh, Jacob and his 70 souls and we became a great nation and we came out of Egypt under Moses but this second time was after we became a great nation and we were sold from the west coast of Africa to the Americas now the Mo and Egypt is a Greek word that means bondage slavery America also represents Egypt which is our bondage and our captivity now it says the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again meaning a second time read it again and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. Again with ships. It's slavery into America a second time. Read on. By the way whereof I spake unto thee. By the way whereof I spake unto thee. Read on. Thou shalt see it no more again. So by the way Moses spoke, it was in Mount Sinai. And read on. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies. And the there is America. America the islands of the Caribbeans. Read on. For bond men and bond women. And he said, you shall be sold unto your enemies, the so-called white man, the Greeks that we read in Joel, the third chapter. Read on. And no man shall buy you. Um, the bond man and bond woman is slave man and slave woman. When it says, no man shall buy you, no man of our people in this captivity was going to redeem us or deliver us out of the hand of the so-called white man. You have many black leaders that try but they fail. Because who's going to deliver us out of this captivity? Jesus the Messiah. And when he comes back, it's not going to be with peace and love. It's going to be with war and great destruction. Right. So let's go to Jeremiah 14 and 2. Right. Okay, to prove the color of Judah. Right. Jeremiah 14, verse 2 says, Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. So the Bible said Judah is mourning. Mourning for what? For better rights, civil rights, equality, for jobs, for more uh, employment, for uh, against the oppression, against the hatred, for you name it, every aspect Judah is mourning. Read on. And the gates thereof languish. So when it says the gates thereof languish, meaning the black leadership of our people is languishing. They languish in the sense that they're not teaching our people the truth as to who they really are, the Israelites. What they're teaching up here, they're African Americans, Islam, and all these different uh, false philosophies. But they're not teaching that they're the Israelites, and the so-called white man is a devil, and he's not the Jew, according to the Bible. Right on. And that ties in what Genesis 49 said about them couching as an old lion. Who shall rouse them up? Okay? So that's what also goes into that language. Our leaders are languishing because they don't know what to teach the people. Okay? It says, they are black unto the ground. So it's showing you that Judah is black unto the ground. Meaning what? They're dark-skinned people. The Jews are dark-skinned people, black people. When you dig up the earth, it's different shades of brown. Dark color. And we're going to prove it more in the historical books. Showing you that the Jews are all black people. Alright? Right. And that ground meaning when he said different shades of brown, because you do have some light-skinned mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, blacks, ranging from a light brown to a very dark brown. Okay, because when you the top layer of the soil is brownish, then the deeper you go, the darker it gets. Okay, so we had to go to the book, this histor historical book called Babylon to Tim Book Two. Now this was written by a black scholar. So me asked him, but why are you using the white man books? We use all books, blacks, white, because it bears reference to the Bible. So we had to go to page eighty-four and read uh, what this uh, black scholar wrote. Right, and his name is uh, Rudolph Winslow. It says. Uh, 
In the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey, more white people, white, the Romans are Italians, white people, that captured Jerusalem. Read on. Captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to the Jewish state. Remember that. They put an end to our rulership, our nation, in the land of Israel, not Africa. Read on. With great slaughter. With great slaughter. They were slaughtering, killing us, butchering us. Mass genocide. Read on. During the period of the military governors of Palestine, many outrages and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa. You hear that? One million Jews fled into Africa. So now, if these Jews are white people, what would be the purpose or the sense of fleeing down to Africa? So show you these were black people. One million Jews fled down into Africa, like we just read in the book of Deuteronomy 20:68, And you were sold from where? From Africa to America. By who? The Africans and the Arabs. Read on. Right, let me bring this out. And this also proves what you had said earlier about the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. Because right after Christ came, the Romans under Vespasian, like we're reading, destroyed Israel, and they lost their power. Okay? I'm going to read on. Fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery, the slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. Okay. So, sure, that's the proof right there. The slave markets, slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. Now, I can show one more book called Sex and Race. This is by J.R. Rogers, another black historian and scholar. All right, in this book on page 91, he asks a question right here. And this is the question that he uh, posed to the readers. It says right in page 91, were the Jews originally Negroes? The answer is yes, and still are. Now, this is what he said about, about the European uh, uh, painters. It says, European painters and sculptors, by the use of white models to typify biblical characters, have falsified tremendously the physiognomy of the ancient Jews. That's true. When was this done? In the Renaissance period. This was done by the Renaissance to typify biblical characters by using white men to portray the biblical characters, Moses, uh, Joshua, Jesus Christ, the apostles, and all the people in the Bible. That's why today you have a prominent picture of this guy uh, that we call Jesus Christ, a white looking guy, which actually his name is Caesar Borgias the second son of Pope Alexander VI of Rome. Now I have another uh, historical book called Nature Knows No Color Line, again by J.R. Rogers, another black historian. And in this book, on, uh, on certain pages, it's going to tell us, he said the Jews of Spain and Portugal were so dark. And he's going to give the history concerning this matter. Now this is on page uh, 123 in uh, uh, Nature Knows No Color Line. And this is what it states in the book. It says right here. It says, White says, an interest, interesting gradation of all shades down to the black is exhibited by the Jews. Especially dark were the Jews of Spain and Portugal. The Portuguese Jews were very dark, says Pritchard. The Duchess of the of de Abrantes, wife of Napoleon's ambassador to Portugal, said that the Jew, the Negro, and the Portuguese would be seen in a single p person. So dark were the Jews, especially of Portugal and southern Spain, that many whites thought all Jews were black or dark. Show you right there. Now he's going to say, it says, many of the Jews who were banished from Portugal by John II settled in the West Indies. John Biglow, who visited Jamaica in 1850, saw the descendants of these Jews and said they were Negroid. So this is the fact right here. These are the facts showing you. So the Bible and history proves the facts that what we're showing, these are the tribes of Israel. In conclusion to the tribe of Judah, I'd like to get one more scripture. Uh, this is Luke 21 and 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. So this was Christ speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and to the nation of Israel showing that the Roman armies was going to come past Jerusalem. Read on. Then know that the desolation thereof is not. Know that the desolation, the destruction of us as a nation of people and of our rulership. 
Read on. Was going to come to an end under the Romans. Read on. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. So those who are in Judea, which is Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. The mountains also represent Masada and down into the interiors of West Africa. Read on. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. He said, depart out of Jerusalem. Why? Because the Romans was going to destroy Jerusalem. Like we read in the book called Babylon to Timbuktu. What happened to Jerusalem? Read on. And let not them that are in the countries enter their into. He said, and those that are into the countries return not back into it. Because there's going to be great slaughter and great atrocities. Read on. Verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance. For these were the days of vengeance upon us for disobeying and breaking the Most High's laws as a nation of people. Read on. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. That all things that are written where? In the prophecies of the Old Testament by Moses and all the prophets had to be fulfilled. And this was the fulfillment of what Christ was speaking about. And us coming to Americas as slaves. Read on. But woe unto them that are with child. So that's it on that one. So we, we're going to begin now with uh, Issachar and Zebulon. Zebulon represents the Indians through up from uh, Guatemala to Panama, and Issachar represents the Mexican Indians known as the Aztecs. So I would like to begin with Genesis 49 and 13. It says, Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea. Now, Jacob was speaking to his son Zebulon. He said, Zebulon, like I said, are the Indians through up Guatemala to Panama. Zebulon, which, which were known as the Mayans when the Spaniards came to the uh, New World. Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea. The haven of the sea that he's talking about is the area known as the Panama Canal Zone. And he shall be for a haven of ships. He shall be for a haven of ships, meaning the major docking point where all ships come in and out for exporting and importing. And when you look at the Panama Canal Zone, it cuts the trip around the world from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. That's why the Panama Canal Zone was built based on the prophecy that Zebulon will be a haven of ships. Read on. And his border shall be unto Zidon. So back in ancient time, even Zebulon used to dwell at the sea coast, and his border extended up until Zidon. Going on. Verse 14. Issachar is a strong ass. Now we're speaking about Issachar, which represents the Aztec Indians, known to them as the Mexicans. Not the Spanish, but those of Indian descent. They call themselves Azteca. Read on. Issachar is a strong ass. So I said Issachar is a strong ass, meaning he's a strong hard worker. Read on. Couching down between two burdens. And the two burdens that he couching down is what? It's uh, Mexico, it's, uh, this is North America, and Central America. And the two burns also the burden that he carries upon his back during all his hard labors. Right. Let me let me say they always show um, the Mexicans that one of their symbols is a is an ass. That's one of their famous uh, symbols. Let me get this picture. Right. The burro. Right. The burro, like you said. Real quick. Okay. This is from this book entitled Mexico Feast and Feminine. Okay. And inside, they show you. The Mexicans riding on the border. Let me open it. Open to it right here. On what page? Uh, there's no page number on it in this All book. Right. Okay. So, let me continue. Verse 15. And he saw that rest was good. And me and the rest was a pleasant land. And the rest that they also have is what they call a siesta, where they stop working at 12 o'clock noonday and they rest. And they don't do no work. Right. Many of the, so a few of the Latin American countries uh, also do that. However, it's the Mexicans who have become famous for it. Anytime you hear of a siesta, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The Mexicans. Okay. I'll read it again. And he saw that rest was good. And it was also a good land, a beautiful land. Read on. And the land that it was pleasant. The land is a beautiful land. So that's where all the American tourists go when they want to go for a vacation. They run down to Mexico, Tijuana, uh, Puerto Vallarta, and all the different places in Mexico. Read on. And bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant so, unto tribute. So he bowed his shoulder. When the Spaniards came over and conquered them, the conquistadores, they bowed his shoulder and became servants. And he says, they bowed their evil minds, and even up until this present day, that's why America is taking NAFTA down to Mexico 
to pay the Mexican workers a minimum wage because they are hard workers. His name, Issachar, means he is hired. And the white man knows this prophecy. That's why he exploit and use the Mexicans as uh, cheap, uh, cheap labor. Right, even here in, in the city, whenever the Japanese or the white man in general wants a cheap labor, who do they get? The Mexicans and pay them less than minimum wage. Because they say none of the other, the blacks surely ain't going to work right. for that, or none of the other uh, Spanish-speaking tribes, but get the Mexicans. You could pay them a buck fifty an hour. They'll do it. Right. Okay. So now, Deuteronomy. let's go to Deuteronomy 33. 18 and 19. Right. So we're doing Zebulon and Issachar, because these two tribes are interrelated. They connect borders. Mexico runs all the way down, extends down to, uh, uh, to Guatemala and all the different, uh, El Salvador, and so forth. All these were the families of the, the, of the Aztecs and the Mayans. And they closely had close relationship. Right. So Deuteronomy 33 verse 18. And of Zebulon, he said, Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tent. So Zebulon rejoiced in their going out when they used to keep the feast. Now, not talking about the wicked feast that they kept when they went off into wickedness. When they came here first, they were keeping the righteous sacrifices. But then they went off into wickedness which is sacrificing uh, the people on the altars and uh, cutting the hearts out. I went off into mass wickedness. So it says, Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. Who was in the tents of Zebulon? The Aztecs. That's why they used to travel back and forth and used to exchange gifts. Right. They were close relatives. Verse 19. They shall call the people unto the mountain. Right. The ones that did the calling was Issachar. During the Middle Ages, they were called the Aztecs because the verse above it says, Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. So it was, it was Issachar that remained in their tents, the Aztecs. They would blow the horn at the, uh, at the uh, feastly occasions and call the tribe of Zebulon up, which were the Mayans, and there they would do sacrifices, okay, sacrifices of righteousness. So I'll read on. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. For they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. And when you look it up, the word Panama means, it means the riches of the seas. The riches of the sea. So Panama is rich in the abundance of fish and all the riches that's in the sea. So he's telling you right here about Zebulon and Issachar too. Right. The, um, in ancient times, they actually, before we came to this side of the world, the Aztecs and the Mayans, back in Jerusalem, they really had sacrifices of righteousness. Now, a lot of you know the history that when they came over here, the Spanish discovered them sacrificing human flesh. Okay, is that recorded in the Bible? Yes. Let's go to, um, briefly, Hosea chapter, I think it's 8 and 13. Hosea chapter 8 and 13. Right. Hosea 8 and 13, yes. They sacrificed flesh for the sacrifices of my offerings. Right. They sacrificed flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings. You heard about Montezuma the first, Montezuma the second. A lot of the great kings of the Aztecs and the Mayans, they were sacrificing flesh for the sacrifices of the Most High's offerings. They became wicked. The Bible bears witness to that. Read. Read it again. They sacrificed flesh for the sacrifices of my offerings. And eat it. And <laughs> eat it. So what kind of flesh was they sacrificing? Human flesh. Check out the history. They were sacrificing one another and eating, the, ripping the hearts out of the chest and then eating it. And giving it to the gods. Right, and, get, and offering it to these strange gods that they were making up. Okay, Baal. Okay, read on. But the Lord accepted them not. Right, because this was the time of prophecy that all things written should be fulfilled, that all vengeance would come down upon Israel. Read. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Right, so the Lord said now he will remember their sins. He's going to visit them. In what form did the Lord visit them? In the form of the Spaniard conquistadors. When they came in 1492 and destroyed them. From 1492 on. Read. They shall return to Egypt. They shall return to Egypt, meaning they shall return to captivity. Okay, so now. Let's go back to, did we finish Deuteronomy 33? Uh, 33, and uh, we're down to the, yes, you finished that. So I'd like to list that the angels today that's living down in, uh, from Guatemala, Palma, they're known as the Kunas, the Chukos, and the San Blas Indians. 
Those are the descendants of the, uh, the Mayan Indians today that's occupying from Guatemala to Panama. Right. Let me go to this book briefly entitled uh, The Hope of Israel, written by Manessa Ben Israel. Okay, these were records that this so-called white man had scribed concerning the Indians that he came across. And by the word, wait, the word Indian comes from the Latin word India, which means servant. That's what it means. So, I'm going to go to page 112. I shall speak somewhat in this discourse of the divers opinions which have been, and shall declare in what countries it is thought the ten tribes are. I'm going to jump down. You must know, therefore, that Alexo Venagas says that the first colonies of the West Indies were of the Carthaginians, meaning Israelites, that's what it's making reference to, who first of all inhabited Hispaniola, which is the Dominican Republic, and as they increased, spread to the island of Cuba, from thence to the continent of America, and after that towards Panama, New Spain, and Peru. Okay, so this guy is letting you know that the Israelites were spread in the Dominican Republic, Cuba, uh, America, Panama, New Spain, meaning Mexico, and Peru. And this will end the conclusion in Zebla and Issachar, but this verse is mainly about Issachar. First Chronicles 12 and 32. And of the children of Issachar, and the children of Issachar, which are the Mexicans, known back then as the Aztecs, read on, which were men that had understanding of the times, which were men that had understanding of the times. The times were what? To understand astronomy and astrology. Knowing the zodiac, reading the heavens. Read on. To know what Israel ought to do. And they, they knew what Israel had to do at certain occasions. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. So all their brethren were at their command when they would foresee and read the heavens. So when you go back in the history, even the Aztecs had calendars. And they knew, they even foretold of uh, futuristic prophecies that occur when you read the, uh, the Codex and the history of the Aztecs on the, the writings on the pyramids. So this will end the conclusion of uh, Zebulon and Issachar. Now we're going to Dan. Right. To the, uh, the Dan, the tribe of Dan. Genesis 49 and 17. And by the way, the word Dan means judge. Okay. Verse 17 says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way. So back in ancient time, when Dan was a judge, Dan was like a serpent to the enemies of the nation of Israel. Like a serpent in the way went to attack his enemies. Read on. An adder in the path. So an adder is a poisonous snake. So when Dan attacked our enemies, it was a vicious and a hard attack. Read on. That biteth the horse heels. So uh, like a horse bite, like a serpent will bite the horse's heel and it will cause the, the, he, uh, the horse to run up backwards and fall backwards. So Dan was like an attacker, a busher against our enemies. Read on. So that his rider shall fall backwards. So Dan destroyed our enemies. And also, too, this is saying, Dan caused the nation of Israel to go back into idolatry. When you read the history of Dan. Okay, so now we're going to go to Deuteronomy 33 and verse 22 to continue on Dan. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. So Dan had a characteristic of a lion's whelp, too, a as courageous, warlike people. Right, like with Samson. He was one of the main ones okay. of the judge of Israel. Right. It reads on, He shall leap from Bashan. Now when it says Dan shall leap from Bashan, Dan was situated in the northern part of Israel. So when it says Dan shall leap from Bashan, meaning Dan was going to leap from, from where he was occupying and blend into the rest of the tribes of Israel. Because what happened to Dan, when you read in the book of Revelation, it's not, it's not mentioned in Dan. Why? Because Dan was blended in with the rest of the tribes of Israel. Basically. Right, and to, to prove that, we're going to go to the New Testament in Revelation chapter 7. Okay, the tribe of Dan, they weren't destroyed as people, but they no longer had a, an inheritance. Like in the past, when the Levites no longer had an inheritance, so in this day and age, the tribe of Dan no longer has an inheritance. The proof of that is Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 1 down to 8. I'm going to read it swiftly if you want to interject, right. do so. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth. So that's the destruction that's going to come from the four corners of the earth, the nuclear destruction that's coming against all nations. Read on. No on the sea, no on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. Israelites. 
Because a lot of you try to be smart and go, see, that includes everybody. It's that includes everybody. It's of the nation. Right. And so is that it? Isaiah 11, 11. Right. And it says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. The second time means when he comes back. Right. To, restore, to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Paphros, from Cush, from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. Who? The outcasts of Israel. The outcasts of Israel, read. And gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Do you hear that? So that explains Revelation 7 and that verse we had read about them coming out of all nations. Okay, so stop the strange doctrine of including the Chinese, the Japanese, the Hawaiians. No, this ain't for you. This is only for the 12 tribes of Israel coming out of all nations under the earth. All right, so with that, we're moving on to the next tribe, which is God, which means true, which is the so-called North Americans, known as the Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Apache, the, Nav uh, the Cheyenne, the Apaches, and so forth. This is what you call the so-called North American Indians, Native American Indians. Now, I want to stress this point because you have scholars and so-called biblical scholars saying, well, uh, North Amer Native American Indians are Chinese. They came from the Bering Strait. This is a bold-faced, blatant lie. You're looking at a so-called North American Indian right here. That's right. Alaga. Since you made that statement, let's go into this book entitled History of the American Indians by James Adair. Okay? He wrote this book in 17, let me look at it real 75. quick, 1775, and it was first published in the United States in 1930. Let's read about, did he find anything about the Native American Indians being descended from the Chinese? I'm going to go to page uh, 13, page 13 and 14. Bear with me, here, here comes right here, all right. I, it says, some have supposed the Americans, meaning the Indians throughout the North America, to be descended from the Chinese, but neither their religion, laws, customs, and especially and etc. agree in the least with those of the Chinese, which sufficiently proves they are not of that line. I'm gonna go to page 14 now. Neither could persons sail to America from the north, referring to the Bering Straits, that lie that you push in schools that the so-called Indians came through the Bering Straits. I'm gonna read it again. Neither could persons sail to America from the north by the way of the Tartary or ancient Scythia that from its situation never was or can be a maritime power. And it is utterly impractical, impractical for any to come to America by sea from that quarter. <laughs> Besides, the remaining traces of their religious ceremonies and civil and martial customs are quite opposite to the like vestiges of the old cities, meaning the old Chinese, okay? Nor, even in the moderate northern climates, is it to be seen the least vestige of any ancient stately buildings or of any thick settlements as are said to remain in the less healthy regions of Peru and Mexico. Several of the Indian nations assure us they crossed the Mississippi before they made their present northern settlements. That's why they call them um, uh, the Indian, many Indians Arawaks, meaning when they traveled from the southern coast of uh, South America or made their way up. Which connected with the former arguments will sufficiently explode that weak opinion of the American Aborigines being lineally descended from the Tartars or ancient Scythians, meaning the Orientals. Jump in, jump down. From, from the most exact observations I could make in the long time I traded among the Indian Americans, I was forced to believe them linearly descended from the Israelites, either while they were a maritime power or soon after the general captivity. The latter, however, is the most probable. This descent I shall endeavor to prove from their religious rites, civil and martial customs, their marriages, funeral ceremonies, manners, language, traditions, and a variety of particulars which will at the same time make the reader thoroughly acquainted with the nations, of which it may be said to this day very little have been known. Right, okay. so I'd like to show in this book too called Native Americans on page 55 you have a group of Apache scouts. 
Then on page 67, you have a you have a, a, a warrior. And page 67, when you see on the screen. Then on page 78, you have another warrior. Then on page 98, you have another Indian warrior. Showing you these are not Chinese. So let's go on to the scriptures. And the first scripture we're going to begin with is Genesis 49 and the 19th verse. Okay. Gad, a troop shall overcome him. Now stop. It said, Gad, a troop shall overcome him. The troop that overcame the so-called North American Indians were, was the U.S. Calvary. Beginning with many different generals, but Custer was the, maze, the, the, the main famous one. And he had other generals after Custer. And from that point, they were destroyed and defeated by the U.S. Cavalry. Right. So that's the prophecy showing you of Gad shall be overcome by a troop. Right. But he shall overcome at the last. But in the end of this captivity, our punishment, Gad is going to overcome. They're going to rise up and get revenge on our enemies. Now the next scripture is, is uh, Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter and the 20th verse. And of Gad he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. So the Most High blessed Gad with a large proportion of the lands in North America, such as here in the United States, Canada. They have the largest areas of land mass. Read it on. He dwelleth as a lion. So he said, Gad dwells a lion. Now you know how a lion dwells? A lion roams the entire prairie, and he covers a large area of land for their uh, territory. And also, too, when he say he dwells as a lion, Gad used to paint their face with war paints, and it shows a warlike character. Read on. Okay. And teareth the arm. Now, when he said he teareth the arm, they would take a knife, and they would cut the skin and make the blood ritual or covenant, saying that we are brothers forever. This came from the so-called North American Indians. Read it on. With the crown of the head. And the crown of his head was what? was the, the Indian bonnet that he wore upon his head. And we're going to show some pictures on that. You can right. show that picture. Let me show you the one from this book entitled uh, The Way of the Warrior. Okay, and inside this book, they show you the crown of the tribe of Gag. Okay, and it specifies here with the crown of the head because the tribe of Gad is letting you know in the last days would have a strange crown. A crown that's unusual to the kings of the earth. Now let's take a look at that crown. Okay. The title says Crowning Glories. And I'm glad it got the word crown there. Because it goes directly with the Bible. Crowning Glories. Do you see that crown? That's a magnificent and beautiful crown. Okay. A war bond. All right. Uh, you have this, some more? In this book called Native American, Native American on page 81. It's going to see a group of Indian chiefs. There it is right here. Here's the crown of the head right here. There's no getting around that scripture. That's the proof right here. The crown of the head. There's another one I'm going to show you on page 85. And, and only top warriors wore these crowns for their victory in battle. Not this one. But this one over here, page 85. See that beautiful crown? That's from the scripture. And that's what the Native Americans, Indians wore upon their head. A crown, a beautiful crown of feathers. Right, you brought out that part about tear at the arm. Right, tear right. the arm. That blood brother covenant. Okay, they would get a sharp stone or a knife and break their flesh and put their hands together so that the blood would mingle. I wouldn't suggest you do that today, though. You get AIDS and drop dead. So, but that was the prophecy on what the tribe of Gad would be doing in the last days. Okay? So what was the next scripture we were uh, going to There's more to that, too. There's more oh, okay. in the 20 verse. Right. Yeah, Deuteronomy 20 verse. 33 Three. and 20. It 21. says... 21. excuse me. Yeah. And he provided the first part for himself. So I mean, when he divided different areas of the land, he took for himself. Read on. Because there were other tribes that came along with him. But Gad took their portion of their land. Read on. Because there, in a portion of the lawgiver, was he seated. So Gad also, too, when he came over, became a lawgiver. Because they took part in what? In the ceremonies, issuing the laws, and showing justice among themselves. Read on. 
And he came with the heads of the people. So when he said he came with the heads of the people, he came with along with the other tribes, such as the, the uh, Puerto Rican Indians, known as the Boricua, Taino, and so forth. They didn't come alone. They came along with the rest of the tribes of Israel. Read on. He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. So he also executed justice and judgment too. That was part of Gad's duty when they came over here. Because Gad had laws, like we just read in the book of uh, James Adair. They kept the laws and the ceremonies, also wearing the fringes. You notice amongst the Native American Indians, they wore the fringes in all their garments. I'm going to show some pictures of that too, when they wore the garments. That was a natural custom. Right, let's get, let's get that in the, uh, I'm going to get that. This is Numbers chapter 15 verse 38. Speaking to the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. So that was the law on, for that the Mosa had given to the Israelites, to wear fringes, and upon your fringes you put a border of blue. As you see in many clips, you see the Native American Indians, we wore fringes, okay? And there's one where you can see, actually see, the ribbon of blue that was according to the laws of the Mosai. And the fringes represented the laws. There were over 600 laws that was given to our people. Okay, so now I'm going to go to First Chronicles 12 and verse 8. It says, And of the Gadites, they were separated themselves unto David. They were scouts. Like the so-called white man used the Apache as scouts to hunt other Apaches down. They were scouts in David's army. Read on. Into the hole to the wilderness, men of might and men of war. They were men of war, courageous, Jeraimo, uh, Victorio, you name them. Great warriors, Santana, Sitting Bull. Read on. Fit for the battle. They were fit for battle, excellent warriors. Read on. That could handle shield and buckler whose faces were like the faces of lions. So, man, they paint their faces with war paint. Right. When they went out to war. I'm going to show, show a clip of that from yeah. this book entitled uh, After Columbus. This is from the Smithsonian Chronicle of the North American Indians. Okay. You got two photographs here showing you what the scripture means when it says whose faces were like the faces of lions. Meaning, like the brother brought out, they used to paint their face fiercely. So they looked terrible when they went to war. Just like a lion looks. Okay, I'm going to read on. It says, Whose faces were like the faces of lions, of lions and, and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. They were swift. Swift. They was good. One, one main tribe that was famous for that were the Apaches. They was good for using uh, what you call ninja tactics tactics in warfare and it, it, it's a history book tells you that the engines were so swift they could run 300 miles non-stop they were swift in war they could uh, run a horse that's how swift they were in battle that's the history and also there's another one in first chronicles 5 and 18 i'm going to first chronicles 5 18 where it tells you right here it says it says the sons of reuben which are the seminar engines who are brothers to the uh not uh gadites it says and the gadites and the half tribe Manessa, which are the so called Cuban Indians, of valiant men, men able to bear buckler and sword, and to shoot with bow and skillful in war. And this book right here, what is this right here? It's showing the bows, the bows and the arrows. The Indians were skillful in using the bow, and they were skillful in war, like I named before, the many different uh, leaders of the uh, so called Native American Indians. <coughs> So that's, those are the scripture and prophecies showing you about the so-called Native American Indians. So at this time we would like to show and prove, according to the Apocrypha, which is in the Bible, how the ten tribes came over to the Americas, known as the New World. And these ten tribes were referred to as what you call Native American Indians, the Indians in Central America, throughout the Caribbean and South America. Now this is the book of Second Ezra, the 13th chapter and the 40th verse. Those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in so, the time of Hosea the king. So this Hosea was the king of Israel during that time when the nation of Israel was split into two, known as the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now at this time, Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, took the uh, ten tribes out of Israel and took them into his country, which is up in Assyria. Read on. 
whom, Sh whom Solomon Nasser, the king of Assyria, led away captive. So they went into slavery under the Assyrians. Read on. And he carried them over the waters, and so they came into another land. So he took them over the waters into the land of Assyria. So he took them from the land of Israel to his land, Assyria, as slaves. Read on. Right. And that's also made mention of in the book of Kings, Second chapter Kings, 17. Second Kings, the 17th chapter. Right. Verse 41. But they took this counsel among themselves. So who took this counsel? The ten tribes, including the tribe of Dan, who was also absorbing to the rest of the tribes of Israel. They took this counsel among themselves. Read on. That they would leave the multitude of the nations and go forth into a further country. So they said, listen, Israel, our brothers, we're going to leave this part of the world where these heathens, these nations are occupying, and we're going to go fall into another country. Read on. Where never mankind dwelt. At that time, when they made this statement, no other nation of people were dwelling in what they call the New World, which is called the Americans. It was unoccupied. Read on. Verse 42. That they might there keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. So they say, if we leave this part of this world and go into another world, another part of the, of, of the earth, we might keep our laws and statutes, which we never did kept. Read on. And they entered into Euphrates. Now this is going to knock out that big, blatant lie that have been taught in the school system that the Indians came from the Bering Strait. That's what it says. It said they entered into the Euphrates. Where is the Euphrates? It's, up, it's above Iraq in the Middle East. They came through the Persian Gulf because the Euphrates extend all the way down to the Persian Gulf. Read on. By the narrow passages of the river. By the narrow passages of the river through the Euphrates and then came all the way down to the, uh, the Persian Gulf. Read on. For the Most High then showed signs for them. The Most High showed the signs in the heaven. So they navigated by the stars. And who was doing this? The tribe of Issachar, the so-called Aztecs, which you call the Mexicans. Read on. And held still the flood till they were passed over. So the Most High held still the rough seas until they were passed through. Read on. For through that country there was a great way to go. For through that country was a great way, a long way to go. Coming from all the way from all the, from the, uh, the Persian Gulf, coming up all the way down to uh, Africa, the, uh, the coast of Africa, the tip of Africa. It was a long way to go. Read on. Namely, of a year and a half. And it took them a year and a half. Why? Because they had to make stops to get what? Water and maybe food. So it took them a year and a half to get from the east all the way to the west, which is known as the Americas, the New World. Read on. And the same region is called Osiris. And that same region is called Asaph, meaning another land, which is known as America. That's the land that came to the Americas. Read on. No, sir. That's it. Mm -hmm. So that was it, showing you how the tribes came over to the New World. It took them a year and a half to get from the east to the west. So that knocks out the lie that they came from the Bering Street. Right. So now let's go to Genesis chapter 49, and we're at verse 20, proving Asher. Asher. So Asher represents the Indians from Colombia all the way down to Uruguay. And we're also dealing with the tribe of Naphtali, which also represents the Indians of Argentina and Chile. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat. So the Most High said, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat. What is his bread? His resources that's in the land of, of South America. Read on. And he shall yield royal dainties. And they shall yield royal dainties. The royal dainties is the fabulous uh, costumes and foods, certain uh, chocolate uh, dainties that they use, they eat. And also, too, he's speaking about what they have every year in Brazil, what they call the carnival. So now let's go to Deuteronomy 33 to finish on Asher. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 24. And of Asher he said, let Asher be blessed with children. So Asher is blessed with children. All South America in Brazil, they're blessed with abundance of a lot of children. That's why at one time they were killing the children off in Brazil. They had certain hit squads uh, killing the young children because the population of the children was growing so much in poverty. Read on. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. So when he says, let him be acceptable to his brethren, he's speaking about the rest of his tribes that were scattered down to the Amazon. Right. That became like cannibals, outcasts. Read on. And let him dip his foot in oil. Now when he says, let him dip his foot in oil, when you look on the map, Venezuela is right above Brazil. And Venezuela is the largest producing South American country that produces oil. So that's what it says, let him dip his foot in oil. Read on. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. He said, thy shoes shall be iron and brass. What's under your shoes? The sword, your foot. So uh, in that country, 
South America is filled with a lot of natural resources as well. Uh, uh, silver, uh, gold, uh, copper, and all, aluminum, all sorts of natural resources that's needed for uh, your building of materials and so forth. Read on. And as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And, and so as the days are, so are the strength. They constantly multiply and increase it. So South America is a rich country in resources. Right. So now let's go to Genesis 49 once again in verse 21 to prove Naphtali. So Naphtali represents the Indians of Argentina and Chile, known as the Araucan Indians, that lives in the southern part of, of South America. Read on. Naphtali is a hind let loose. So a hind let loose is like, it's like a, uh, what you call like a horse. Or uh, it's like a wild goat. Right. They're like nomads. They wander. Right. Okay. So they call them the gauchos. Yeah. But not, I'm not talking about the Spanish that went over there and classified themselves as gauchos. I'm talking about the real Indians of that area. Read on. Because he, down in, in, uh, in Argentina and Chile, you have a lot of so-called Spaniards in that area. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the true inhabitants of that country. Read on. He of giveth. Indian descent. He, Read on. He giveth goodly words. So the people of Argentina give goodly words because when you look up the word, uh, the capital of Argentina is what? It's Buenos Aires. In Spanish, mean it means good air, pleasant. So the, the, the Indians of that country were pleasant people until the Spaniards came and robbed and destroyed them. Right. So Read now on. let's go to Deuteronomy 33 and 23. It says, And of Naphtali he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor. And they're satisfied with favor. They're pleasant people. The land is full with what? With the blessings of grapes, wine. Precious wine that comes from Argentina and Chile. Read on. And full with the blessing of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. Now, when you look on the map, Chile possesses the, the farthest uh, west, western point in South America. Possess thou the west and the south. And Argentina possesses the most southern point in South America. When you look on the map, Chile and Argentina. Chile is the west. And Argentina is the most southern point of South America. Right. Possess thou the west and the south. Also, because this is in the western hemisphere. Right. Okay. Possess thou the west and the south. As he brought out, the southernmost part is uh, Argentina. Argentina. And Chile is to the west. Right. And also, too, when he said the most I blessed him, Argentina possesses a large amount of beef. The cattle industry in Argentina. Okay, so now we're going back to Genesis 49, and we're going to deal with Joseph. Right. Okay, which became Ephraim. You can expound on that. Now we're going to deal with the tribe of Joseph, which represents also the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. And to show you that scripture real quickly, go to Numbers 132. It says, Of the children of Joseph, the children of Ephraim by their generations. So jo uh, Ephraim took the prosperity of his father Joseph, but the name was still there. So let's read Genesis 49. Right, real quick. In Genesis 48, when a blessing was to come on Joseph, he asked uh, his father to give it to his sons, Joseph, I mean Ephraim and Manasseh. So Ephraim was the younger boy, Manasseh was the older. You can read the story on your own. So the greater blessing was put on Ephraim. It tells you that um, Jacob crossed his hands like so and put his right hand on the younger boy and his left hand on the older boy and put the blessings. On them. So read Genesis 48 to get the history behind that. So now, we're going to speed up because we're running short of time. So we're in Genesis 49 and 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow. So it said Joseph is a fruitful bow, meaning his posterity, Ephraim is fruitful. They have a lot of children. They're offspring. Read on. Even a fruitful bow by a well. So it's showing you, even when you plant a bow by a well, it becomes very fruitful. It, it produces a lot of fruits. Anything that's planted next to uh, rivers of water or a well, it becomes very pr uh, productive. Read on. Whose branches run over the wall. Now it says, whose branches run over the wall. When the uh, Puerto Ricans was over here in the islands and the Spaniards came and conquered them, their daughters married into the, fa into the family of the Spaniards. So that's what it says, their branches ran over the wall. They went out of their family uh, line and went over into the Spaniards. Let's put it in the scripture in uh, Hosea, the fourth chapter and the 17th verse. Because it's going to explain to you about Ephraim, how Eph what Ephraim did and what happened to Ephraim when the Spaniards came and conquered the island of Puerto Rico. Hosea, the fourth chapter and the 17th verse, explains what happened to Ephraim. Uh, let me go to Hosea chapter 7 and right. verse 8. Right, that's right. It says, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Right, some of them, not all of them. 
some of them have mixed themselves amongst the people which were the Spaniards. Read on. Ephraim is a cake not turned. So it says Ephraim is like a cake not turned. Now let me give you an example of a cake. When you have a cake that's one part is well done, and when you turn the other side over it's not fully done, it's like a yellowish color. So that's what it's uh, referring to Ephraim, is like a cake not done. He's like a light complexion. Light. Not real dark no more, he's light. Read on, there's more to that? No, that was it. Okay. Okay, so now let's go, let me go back to that. It says, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well, whose branches run over the wall. I wanted to say something right. concerning that over the wall. In Puerto Rico, they have a giant wall that's called El Moro. Right. That the Spanish built to keep the other invading whites out. Okay, so now that, that's exactly what the scripture is talking about, but it lets you know that the women of Puerto Rico, the Boricua Indians, they went over that wall and started dealing with the Spaniard whites, okay? And then they had children, and those children went back and dealt with the true Boricuas, okay, and had offspring. That brought about the change in the complexion of their skin, right. okay? So I'll read on. The archers have sorely grieved him. And the archers that sorely grieved the Puerto Rican Indians, the Taino and the Boricua and so forth, was the Spaniards. They hated them. They butchered and massacred them. Read on. And shot at him and hated him. And they shot at them with the, with the guns. And they hated the so-called Puerto Ricans. So this was one example of the hatred that was displayed towards the Boricua and the Italian Indians by the Spaniards. So now, when you read for it in, in Genesis 49, it gives a history of Joseph. So from there, we're going to go to uh, Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter, and the 13th verse. And of Joseph, he said, Blessing... Blessed of the Lord be his, his land, excuse me, for the precious things of heaven. So now the most I is telling you about the land of Ephraim, the Puerto Ricans, for the blessing of the land and for the precious things of heaven, the sun, the moon, the good climate, the temperature, and all the beautiful fruits and so forth that grows in the island. Read on. For the dew and for the deep that couches beneath. And the dew, in the morning you see the dew upon the grass. The dew is what help your uh, crops to grow good in the morning too. Read on, and it says, for the deep that culture beneath is a beautiful seas, the tropical uh, climate, climate, and uh, the blue seas. Read on. And for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun. And the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, the pineapple, the mangoes, all the Goya products, all the beautiful uh, precious fruits that grows in the island of Puerto Rico. And Cuba. Read on. And for the precious things put forth by the moon. And the precious things put forth by the moon. When the moon comes out at night in Puerto Rico, this is the only unique thing that that uh, uh, this uh, what is called a, a frog or coqui yeah. that lives in the island of Puerto Rico that comes out at night time. And th this frog is proven by scientists. It only lives in Puerto Rico. When you take this frog and, put, and place him any place else, it will automatically die. And this coqui at night makes a particular sound goes. So that's the sort of precious things put forth by the moon, and it also represents the, the uh, vegetation and the fruits. Read on. Verse 15. And for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills. Let me explain that. This is making reference to all the beautiful and wonderful vegetation that's on within the hills and the mountains of uh, Boricueño. Okay, also I wanted to bring out the word Boricua. It does not mean Puerto Rico, not to get off the topic. Boricua means brave, noble lords. It's an ancient word, okay, an ancient Hebrew word, because we have already proved to you that all the so-called Indians throughout the Americans and the islands spoke Hebrew, okay? We brought it out also in uh, Lost Tribes in the Promised Lands that the, ch that the children of Joseph, the tribe of Joseph, lived on an island nearby. Okay, which were the so-called Puerto Ricans and the so-called Cubans. Okay, verse 16. And also, too, in that same verse, for the chief things of the Asian mountains, coffee or coffee grows in the mountains, too. And some of the, uh, the Indians hid some of their treasures in the mountains when the Spaniards came and conquered them. So some of the riches were still hidden in the mountains of Puerto Rico, like in the Junque, the jungle, and the area parts. Read it on. Verse 16. And for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, speaking about the vegetation, the fruits, and so forth, read on. And for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. And the gussi also, the, and also said the precious things of the earth means a good soil. They have good uh, soil for planting. 
Read on. And for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. And for the good, you could elaborate on that point. Oh, good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Meaning, this is going back in the history. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai, who dwelt in the bush? The Most High. Okay, he, the spirit of the Most High was in there. So all the blessings that Ephraim that came upon Joseph and his children, Ephraim and Manasseh, was according to the will of the Most High. Okay, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. So all his blessing came upon Joseph, which was the father of Ephraim and Manasseh when he was separated to Egypt. Read on. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock. So his strength, the strength of Ephraim coming from his father Joseph. Read on. And his horns are like the horns of unicorns. And his, the horn represents his power, his strength. That Ephraim was, became a valiant warrior amongst the tribes of Israel when the nation was split. Read it on. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. So Ephraim was the one that pushed and brought the rest of the tribes over here. Because when the nation was split, Ephraim became the chief, the principal leader over the northern kingdom. So Ephraim brought the tribes over here along with all the injured the rest of the tribes of Israel. Read on. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the ten, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. He's showing you about Manasseh, which are the Cuban Indians, the Saboni Indians. Right. Let me say this: when we read in the Apocrypha, in the Book of Esdras, about how the tribes came over here, this is explaining to you it was the tribe of Ephraim that led them with Manasseh. Okay, they led the tribes over here. And if you notice in here, it, kept, it keeps mentioning it says precious fruits, precious things of the earth, and the precious precious things in the sea. The, um, the national anthem of Puerto Rico is called Precious. Okay, and that's not a coincidence. Right. <laughs> and also in Cuba too, Cuba produces a lot of sugar cane, it's, it produces coffee, tobacco. Cuba is a rich producing country too. Right. One time Cuba was a very large producing country that produced sugar cane to, uh, to the we uh, western world. Let's go to Hosea chapter 4 verse 17. Okay. It says, Ephraim is joined to idols, meaning the so-called Boricua Indians, you are joined to idols, meaning you love idol worship. You got idols on your dashboards in your car, you got a shrine of idols in your house, you got the, 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 on your what? On your body tattoos. Tattoos on your bodies, you got that fake image of Christ everywhere. And if somebody tries to tell you about it, you, you say that they're dead wrong. So the scripture says, if you can't get rid of them idols, the, us, the prophets, the teachers, we are to leave you alone okay so now it's not just Ephraim that's joined the idols when it says Ephraim you were the top tribe because the Dominicans are on that the Mexicans and so on and so on you Latino tribes right. okay and we brought out about the uh, the mixing of themselves and they're, them being like a cake unturned mm -hmm. it's not just you Puerto Ricans Dominicans Mexicans a lot of you also that that curse fell on all of you Okay, and then the Puerto Ricans have a lot of bot uh, botanical stores in the, uh, in the barrio, in the, in the neighborhood, where you sell all these different idols, where you go for these different uh, oils to put in your body to chase away evil spirit or to trap your man. Right, candles everywhere. Yeah. Green candle for money. Right. Okay, but let's get let's go on to um Benjamin. Benjamin. Travel Benjamin. Genesis forty nine and uh, verse twenty seven. Right. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. So it says Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. Now, a wolf, when a wolf raven, he before he attacks his prey, he rolls in a wolf pack and he shouts and raven <coughs> before he attacks the prey. So that's the way the so-called Jamaicans and so forth roll. It's a boy, I mean, lick shop on you, boy. Before they attack you, they start getting up a lot of noise and let you know they're going to make the attack. And showing that Benjamin is a warring tribe. All the, for Benjamin, which is the Jamaicans, Trinidadians, Antiguans, and all speaking the chain of iron in the Caribbean. That's the child of Benjamin. Right. Can I say this on that? Yeah. When it's when you look up the word raven, it means communicate wild. Right. Like a wolf. That people get scared when Benjamin talks. Yeah, they think they wanna wanna fight, then they just ask him for some coffee. That also that also goes into their music. Right. Whereas the American black is singing about love and all that. What's Benjamin singing about? Taking down the white man. Babylon shall fall. Okay. Judgment upon Babylon. And, and when you go back in the, in the reggae songs like with Peter Tosh and Bonnie Williams, Steve Buzz, the, the reggae's back in the late 60s and the 70s was all about revolution against the system. Right. Where the American blacks never saw about the revolution or destruction of the system, but the so-called Western song, those militant songs, by the rivers of Babylon, uh, the judgment of Babylon, uh, and all these different revolutionary songs pertaining to the judgment of the great whore. And a lot of Rastafarians, 
the, the main one that came up with the idea of teaching about Babylon and so forth. They know they're Israelites, but they go off into the Hayes philosophy and Ethiopian right. doctrine. Let's read on. Yeah. It says, in the morning he shall devour the prey. So in the morning of our rulership, when the Most High raises us up, Benjamin is going to be vicious upon our enemies. Right. Read and on. at night he shall divide the spoil. And at night is going to rob the enemies of the spoil and take back what rightfully belongs to us. Right. The night meaning the night of the so-called white man. The end of your kingship. Right. Okay. So now, let's go to Deuteronomy 33 and verse 12. And of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord. Because Benjamin was the youngest son of Jacob, and he became the beloved. When uh, they was down in Egypt, Joseph told his brother to send for uh, Benjamin. And Jacob was, oh, man, you going to send my youngest son now? So now I'm really going to die now. Read on. Shall dwell in safety by him. So Benjamin dwells in safety of the Most High, which is between the Caribbean islands, between North America and South America. That's the safety of the Most High. Read on. And the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. And it sure represents the skies and the seas, the beautiful seas that's covering the West the Caribbean islands. Right. So, so now let's go back to Genesis 49 and verse 28. Right. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. So all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is it that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. So okay. he's showing you all the tribes. Remember we just read in Nature Knows No Color about the Jews that were in Portugal and Spain were so dark that when John Bigelow came to the Caribbean Islands in Jamaica, he found them there in the Isle of Jamaica, which right. were the Benjamites, and he said they are Negro. And a lot of Jamaicans know the history that they are Israelites, but they go into a different philosophy of Ethiopia. Right. So now let's jump back to Deuteronomy 33 and verse 29. It says, Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord? And Israel is going to be saved by the Lord. Read on. The shield of thy help. And who is the sword of thy excellency? And the most high is our sword that's going to get vengeance veg against our enemies. Read on. And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee. And all of our enemies are going to be found liars unto us. Read on. They're found liars now. Now, right. Right now, now this as second. As we're speaking. And thou shalt tread upon their high places. So the high place we're going to tread upon is to take away the white man's rulership under the powers of the Most High by the nation of Israel. So that concludes the 12 tribes of Israel. And we like to name the, uh, the names of the tribes. Judah, his name means the Most High praises. Benjamin means son of the right hand. Levi means joined to me. Simeon means affliction heard. Zebulon means uh, dwelling. Ephraim means fruitful. Manasseh means made to forget. Gad means true. Reuben means see as a son. Nephtali means my wrestling. Asher means happy. And Issachar means he is hired. So these are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. In the Hebrew, it's known as Yahawada for Judah. Benjamin is Banyamian. Levi is lawyer. Simeon is Shammaiwan. Zebulon is Zab Zab Zabalawan. Ephraim is Aparayim, Manasseh is Manasseh, Gad is Gad in Hebrew, Reuben is Ra'aban, Naphtali is Naphtali, Asher is Asher, and Issachar is Yeshachar in the Hebrew. So these are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, which are the so-called black Americans and the so-called Native American Indians and the Indians scattered throughout the Americas, Central and South America. So with that, this is the conclusion of 12 Tribe Productions for the House of David. We say Shalom. Shalom.